Second Baptist, thank you for having me. Jim, thank you so much for having me back. Um, I'm a little roomy up here, guys. If you can get, take a little of the volume off the stage, that'd be great. Um, Matt, uh, Mark chapter 2, if you have your Bibles. So again, thank you to Jim. Thank you for uh, uh, inviting me to be here today. I, I love your pastor and his family, and uh, we, we love Second Baptist. Jim asked me, gosh, it was last year, and Jim asked me about coming back, and he said it was Senior Adult Day, which I, I couldn't figure out why you would want to get a young whippersnapper like me to come back on uh, Senior Adult Day. And then I told Jan earlier, I know why now. My wife has been getting ARP invitations for about the past 10 years in the mail, and so it's her. Y'all, y'all know she's getting them, um, and I, I am in trouble for that after church. church. She didn't know I was going to say that, but... Uh, uh, and, and I am a pastor now, and, and I, I was getting three questions, and, and so I'll just answer those. Number one, where is Peavine? And you didn't ask this, but you want to know why it's called Peavine Creek. I know you want uh, Peavine. It's because there's a creek called Peavine Creek, and a lot of things in the community are named after that. Uh, it's, it's, in the, it's in North Georgia, but it, it's really uh, part of the Chattanooga metro area. We're about 20 minutes from downtown Chattanooga uh, uh, go, going some back roads. And so... Um, but don't let that impress you. We are in the middle of nowhere. You're, you're going down a little road, and you're thinking, well, th what a cute little church this is going to be. And then all of a sudden, it opens up to a church that runs about 1,500 uh, sitting on the side of the road. Um, we, it, it, the second question I got, where is it? Uh, how, how's it going? It's going great. We grew about 20% last year. We're on track to go 28% this year. We had almost 3,000 at Easter. And so God's really, really blessing us there. And so, um, uh, thank you. The third question we get is, well, wait, how are you doing that bivocational? And I'm really blessed. The North American Mission Board, our president, Kevin, really, he's, he's like all of us that do what I do. You, you miss having a church family after a while. So he really understood it and um, allows me to do it. And I still work for NAM full-time during the day, don't uh, uh, do church activities during the day. Now, we haven't even moved yet. I've, we've bought a house but haven't moved and um, so we get moved up there, but I just need to be close to an airport because my job is mainly a travel job. And so as long as I'm close to an airport, uh, that's good. And so I only have certain duties, and that's we only have Sunday morning worship on Sunday, so preach on Sunday mornings, uh, no day activities. Uh, my three jobs are to preach on Sunday mornings, cast vision, and lead the staff. And that's about all I uh, can do by vocationally. But God's really, really blessing it. So uh, we, we would covet your prayers. And I know some of you are thinking, some of you don't know us. Well, if you're a pastor, why are you here? And it's because we love Second Baptist. I told the church uh, staff, I'm just taking a day off. Uh, but uh, Jim asked, and we're, we're very excited about being here today. So all that out of the way. Uh, to the senior adults, man, you're not kidding when you say it's the greatest generation. They don't make them like you anymore. And so we're, I'm thrilled that you have a day to honor you. And so uh, Jim told me just to preach this morning, which is what I'm going to do. I'm just going to preach not to you. Um, you don't need the sermon. It's the rest of us that needs the sermons anyway. Uh, and so, uh, but I'll speak directly to you at the luncheon that's afterwards. Uh, and so just to tie that up. So Mark chapter 2. I want to preach this subject today. Get your friends to Jesus. Now, we're not going to read j just now, so just hold your place. And uh, we'll stand, as a matter of fact, and read in just a moment. In 1994, Premier Magazine interviewed uh, Kevin Bacon about the film The River Wild. And in that interview, Kevin Bacon said that he had worked with everybody in Hollywood or had worked with someone who's worked with somebody in Hollywood. So uh, later on in 1994, three Albright College students by the name of Craig Fast, Brian Turtle, and Mike Ginelli invented a game that you may have heard of called the Six Degrees of Separation. On that day, they were watching a movie called Footloose, which has Kevin Bacon in it. And right after that went off, a new, another movie called The Air Up There came on, which has Kevin Bacon in it. And they began to wonder, how many people has Kevin worked with and how many degrees are people se separated from Kevin Bacon? So they really invented a game called Six Degrees of separation. And it, back, back in the day, it's still mentioned today a lot. Back in the day, it kind of took the country by storm. And so it started showing up in sitcoms, in movies, uh, uh, on talk shows. People would invite 
uh, guest in and then ask them how far removed they were from Kevin Bacon. So here's how the game goes. If, you, uh, if you've worked with Kevin Bacon, you're one degree of separation. If you've worked with someone who's worked with Kevin Bacon, you're two degrees of separation. They surmise that Kevin Bacon is quite possibly the center of the known universe. So in 2012, this is no joke, I'm going to prove it to you, Kevin, uh, Google got in the Kevin Bacon game. And so now on Google, if, and I'm going to open up my phone and do it, and just, if you type in Bacon number, somebody give me an actor's name. Let me do Johnny Depp. It pulled up. Bacon number and Johnny Depp. The number two comes up. And it says Johnny Depp and Meryl Streep appeared in the movie Into the Woods, and Meryl Streep and Kevin Baker appeared in The River Wild. He's two degrees separated from uh, Johnny Depp. The, the, the theory is no one in, the, in Hollywood or even in the world is more than six degrees away from Kevin Bacon. Give me another. Here's Tom Cruise. Kevin Bacon, Tom Cruise, one degree of separation. They typed in a, uh, they worked together in a movie called A Few Good Men. It's always fun to Google your own name, bacon number Joel Sutherland. <laughs> and it's just a picture of me eating a plate of bacon is all that is. And so uh, um, that ended awkwardly. But anyway, so your bacon number. So the theory is that Kevin Baker is the center of the universe and, and that all of us are kind of connected to Kevin. Well, here's the truth this morning. I don't care how far away you are from Kevin Bacon, but I do care how many degrees of separation you have from the person who is really the center of the universe, and his name is Jesus. It's not important how far away you are from Kevin Bacon, but it is very important that uh, you be close to Jesus. And God has so designed the world that everyone is to be in relationship with him. God's grace is big enough. God's blood is powerful enough that every person who has ever, li ever lived should be one degree of separation. And that is you and, 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 or even me. We have a personal relationship with Jesus. But get this. God has so designed Christianity that if you don't know Jesus, the, the plan of God is for you to know someone who does know Jesus. The plan of God is for you to be no more than two degrees away from him. That is, you know someone who does know Jesus. Now, if you're a believer here today, here's the mindset that you have to understand. That God has all of these unbelievers in your life, not to bother you, not to get on your nerves, but so that you can be their connection to the Lord Jesus Christ. And if you know someone who needs Jesus, it is your responsibility it is your assignment. It is even your privilege to get them to Jesus. Just like the guys in the story I want us to read about today. So would you stand with me as we honor God's word? And look in Mark chapter 2, beginning in verse 1. And again, Jesus entered Capernaum after some days, and it was heard that he was in the house. In verse 2, immediately many gathered together so that there was no longer room to receive them, not even near the door. And he preached the word to them. Then they came to him, bringing a paralytic who was carried by four men. And when they could not come near him because of the crowd, they uncovered the roof where he was. So when they had broken through, they let down the bed on which the paralytic was laying. And Jesus saw their faith. He said to the paralytic, son, your sins are forgiven you. And some of the scribes are sitting there and reasoning in their hearts, why does this man speak blasphemies like this? Who can forgive sins but God alone? But immediately when Jesus perceived in the spirit that they reasoned thus within themselves, he said to them, why do you reason about these things in your heart? Which is easier to say to the paralytic, your sins are forgiven you, or to say, arise, take up your bed and walk. But that you may know that the Son of Man has power on earth to forgive sins, he said to the paralytic, I say to you, arise, take up your bed and go to your house. Immediately he arose, took up his bed, and went out in the presence of them all, so that all were amazed and glorified God, saying, We never saw anything like this. Thank you. You may be seated. Hey, let me do this. Let me take just a few minutes and walk you through this passage, and then I just want to make 
three observations about getting your friends to Jesus. You begin in verse number one, and sailors used to describe a phenomenon called St. Elmo's Fire. It was when a thunderstorm would be on the seas and the air would become so charged with electricity that the tips of the mast would put off an electrical discharge causing a bluish glow in the air. And when you, sailors would say, when you saw that glow, you knew something was about to happen. That's the way it must have felt in verse number one because the Bible says that Jesus was in the house. Here's what we know. Reaching people at church has always been about Jesus being in the house. In verse number two, the, the crowd found Jesus. It was a suffocating crowd that blocked the entrance to the house. Mark more than any other gospel writer, talks about crowds. As a matter of fact, uh, before we get finished with the book of Mark, even before we get through chapter 10, Mark has used the, the word crowd or a derivative of it some 40 times, painting the picture for us of the large multitudes of people that were following Jesus. As a matter of fact, I love it in the New Living Translation, they translate the word crowds, visitors, guests almost the way we would call them in a church. And the Bible says in verse number two, he did what we all ought to do when we get a crowd of people far from God around us, he preached the word unto them. And then verse three and four, while he was preaching, three, uh, four men arrived carrying a man on a homemade stretcher. He was paralyzed. And so they, they tried to get in through the front door and they couldn't get him in through the door. And so just to make a long story short, they went up on top of the roof and they dug a hole in the roof. And these four men uh, maybe with ropes or whatever, they lowered him from the roof right down in front of Jesus and they laid him at the feet of Jesus. Four guys who were not going to take no who, for an answer. They were going to do everything in their power to get their friend to Jesus knowing that he had the answer to the friend's problem. So here you've got four guys on the roof. They've ripped the roof off. They've lowered their friend down at the feet of Jesus and the Bible says that Jesus looked up and saw the faith of the friends, not the man. He saw the faith of their friends, and he looked at the paralytic man who was laying on the stretcher, could not move, and he looked at that man and he said, son, your sins are forgiven. Now before we over-spiritualize that drama unfolding I think somebody on the roof went wait maybe we weren't specific enough Jesus I don't know if you noticed the plan was not to get his sins forgiven we ripped the hole in the roof you may not have figured it out he can't walk so we appreciate the sins forgiven and all that but couldn't you have done that second after the man got up and walked And the scribes were there. The Pharisees had been discharged to come to this follow Jesus around. Whenever a crowd gathered, the Pharisees were close by. And they had been discharged because they were looking to catch Jesus in his words. And when the, they heard that Jesus had uh, forgiven him in, in, in verse 5, 6, and 7, in their estimation, and really in ours as well, that's blasphemy. Because if you're forgiving the sins of man, you're elevating yourself to a God-like status. And so they correctly reason that if this man thinks he can forgive sins, then this man must think he's God. And it was a crime punishable by death. And so they start to plan. So you move on to verse number 8, and Jesus, discerning their hearts and their thoughts, just said, well, is it easier to say your sin's forgiven or is it easier to say get up and walk? And here's the truth. It is easier to say your sins are forgiven. We're not talking about do. We're talking about say, right? It's easier to say your sins are forgiven because I can't see if your sins have been forgiven. But if I say to a person who's a quadriplegic, get up and walk, I'm kind of putting myself out on the hook there, aren't I? It's, it's the same reasoning if you watch television preachers. They don't ever raise the dead. You know, it's like, we're going to heal you of arthritis. 
but I can't see if you've really been healed of arthritis. Just raise somebody from the dead and get it over with, right? They don't do that. But you hold them accountable. And so Jesus said, well, you answer me. Is it easier to say your sins are forgiven or get up and walk? Well, it's easier to say your sins are forgiven. It's a rhetorical question. And, and so Jesus said, so that you may know. It's a good word there in the Greek. The word know there in the Greek means to know beyond a shadow of a doubt. So choir, he, look, he looked at the Pharisees, and he's got a paralyzed man in front of him. He's still got four guys up there in the roof who have lowered him down. Not that high a roof, I hope, but they lowered him down. And they have said, which is easier to do? And they, he said, all right, so that you may know I can forgive sins. Let's just take it to the next level. And he said, arise, take up your bed, and walk home. And the Bible tells us as it closes out in verse number 12 that immediately he arose. Picked up his bed with his arms and used his legs to run out and tell everyone what had happened. There's the story. The man who had no hope but yet a man who had friends who were determined to get him to the place where no hope can go and can find hope, getting him to Jesus. Now, church, I want to tell you, that is the kind of church that God has called Second Baptist Church to be. The kind of church that goes out and gets their friends. The kind of church that goes out and brings their coworkers. The kind of church that goes out and gets their family and we find people who are far from God, people who have no hope, and we get them to the person who can give them hope. And what is his name? Jesus. So let me say some things about getting your friends to Jesus. Number one, here's what I want you to know. We all know people who need Jesus. We all know people who need Jesus. See, these four men have probably done everything they could to get their friend to Jesus. Maybe they were even family members of this man. Maybe they were neighbors with this man. Maybe they went to church together. Maybe they, went to, they were co-workers. Maybe they were playing on the same softball team. I, I don't know what they did, but no doubt they were doing all they could do to help this family out. They've been helping his wife financially. They've been helping his kids. In all probability, this was some kind of accident that overtook this man. And so here these four guys are. Man, they're, they're struggling, trying to help this guy out, trying to help his family out. But there's only so much they could do. And then they heard that Jesus was in the house. And he, one of them got an idea. They said, that's what we need to do. They knew another doctor was not the answer. They knew medicine was not the answer. They knew no one else could help. They had a friend that desperately needed to be introduced to Jesus. And so hear what they said. They said, boys, we have tried everything. Let's do this. He can't stop us. Let's get him to Jesus. Let's both of us grab a corner of that stretcher and let's get him in the house to Jesus. Because here's what we know. I've heard that Jesus can heal the lame, make the blind to see, make the deaf to hear. We, we, we've heard that he's taken diseases. He's even raised the dead. So let's do this. If, G, if there's any place this guy can find help, if there's any hope for him at all, Let's get him to Jesus. And I want to say to you this morning that God has placed people in your life, that God has placed people in your path, that God has placed people in your circle, and it is your responsibility to get them to the place where they can find hope. As a matter of fact, there are people in your life that only you can invite to church. There are people in your life that only you can reach with the gospel. There are people in your life that only you can show the love of Christ. I know what some of you are thinking as well. That's why we've got Brother Jim here. That's why we've got a staff here. No, no, their job is not to do that. As a matter of fact, they hang out with saved people all day long in all probability. It's more fun to hang out with lost people, truth be known. But they're not going to come into contact with the people you work with, with the people you play ball with, with the people you, you vacation with, with the people you cross on the street. No, God has placed you in their, their path. And the fact is, listen, I don't mean to be too heavy this morning, but the fact is if you don't get them to Jesus, chances are they'll never get there. The fact is if you don't care, probably nobody else cares. If you don't have a burden, no one else has a burden. 
If you're not concerned, then no one else is concerned. If you're not praying, there's no one else is praying. There is a reason you are where you are in life. God has placed you there on mission. A missionary is not somebody that goes overseas or around the world or even across the state. You are a missionary. And your life is meant to be lived out exhaustively and exclusively for the mission of God. And all those problems in people's lives that are causing them to fall and fail are placed there by God. So you can come along and pick them up. You say, man, it's God. I'd love for him to get saved, but his life is a mess. Why do you think his life is a mess? Man, I'd love for this gal, but man, her marriage is all messed up. It may be that her marriage is all messed up. It may be that they are so far from God so that when they are lying flat on their back, you're there to point them to Jesus. A few years ago, my wife and I were headed to uh, uh, around, down around St. Mary's, Georgia. It was her family reunion we go to every year in, in uh, September. And uh, uh, I went uh, to place some things in the car. We were about to pull out of the driveway, literally five minutes from pulling out of the driveway. And I went to place something in the back seat of the car. And I really wish I could say, I really wish I could, Jim. I wish I could say that there had been an auto accident and I had picked a car up off a lady that was uh, trapped underneath her car and I saved her and her kids and her puppy and everybody too. I mean, I wish I could say that. I bent over to basically place something that weighed about the same amount of feather weighs in the back seat of my car. And I don't know what happened. Has anybody ever thrown your lower back out before? I don't know what happened. I just bent over, choir. I just went like this, and I laid it, and, and I know you say, well, bend your knees. Listen, I don't, I don't need to bend my knees for a piece of paper. I just bent over and laid a piece of paper in the back seat, and it was like, it, it was like Rambo had taken that big, long knife that he carries around with him, and he just jabbed it into my back, in the small of my back, instantaneously, immediately. I've never had anything like it. Immediately. Tears came to my eyes. My face flushed and turned red. And I dropped to my knees and began to moan out loud as much as I could. I was screaming. I was crying. And Sherry was still upstairs getting ready. I mean, to be honest, the only reason to scream and cry is for somebody to give you sympathy, right? I mean, like, so I tried to cry a little louder. I tried to scream a little louder. I tried to moan for help. I tried to do anything. I was laying in our driveway, and I could not, I, I, I just, if you've ever had it happen to you, you know what the pain's like. I didn't know what happened to me. I didn't know if I'd been shot. I didn't know what had happened to me. I just was laying there, moaning, crying, and nobody's there to help me. And so I decided if I'm going to get any help, I'm going to have to get closer to the house because she can't hear me over the hairdryer, whatever's going on upstairs. And so I began, I couldn't walk. I began to drag myself with one arm through the garage. Which, again, is no fun if nobody's watching you do it. If nobody steps out and says, Blaze, what is happening? It's no fun. It's just work. <laughs> and so I kept dragging myself across the garage, stopping every few minutes just to scream as loud as I could and was not getting any help. And I said, Daggum, I'm going to have to get all the way in the house, I guess, to get any help. And so I'm, I drug myself over to the threshold of the door that goes from the garage into our kitchen, and I could go no further. And I kind of drug my, the threshold's about just a few inches high I kind of I kind of threw myself sideways on it and uh, laid back and uh, just began to sob nobody listened to anything for me eventually my wife came down the stairs she said what are you doing in the floor get up man why did we gotta go I didn't see her coming. I didn't even cry in time for her to, to get there. And so that whole thing was ruined. But um, I laid there in the floor. My back, I mean, I can't tell you, sweat was dripping off my face. And it was cool. I mean, I was just dying. And so uh, uh, I said, I don't know. I don't know what's happened. I, I don't, I mean, like, I, do, I really don't know what's happened to me. I can't walk. And she's like, well, we got a family reunion to go to, so you're going to do something. And I'm like, now I'm telling you, I'm dying. I'm dying. And she began to see the seriousness of, if she had seen me crying, she would have known it was serious, but I missed that opportunity. And so I, I laid there and was just, I mean, I was just, I laid on the threshold for about 45 minutes. And would, anytime she tried to move me, 
I hurt worse. It was, the, it was miserable. She finally took me by the arm, and we have a set of sta- a staircase right there. She drug me up to about the first step, and, and I was able to push myself up. And uh, uh, the story ends with, I mean, I was just fine. It, it wasn't that bad. But, I mean, no, it was bad. But it was, uh, but here's the truth. When, it, when I was laying there, I, I went to the family reunion, by the way. My back hurt all weekend long. But I survived it, and, uh, uh, but anyway, when I was laying there on the threshold, she didn't hear me. She really didn't hear me. She, when I was laying there, I didn't care who came along. Can I be honest? I don't, I don't mean to be crude, but Saddam Hussein ca- could have come along to help get me up, and I would have let him help me at that moment. Like, when you're lying flat on your back in pain, you'll take help from anywhere you can get it. Can I tell you that God puts people in your life flat on their back for one reason? So you can walk along with the gospel and tell them, I empathize with where you are. I sympathize with where you are. I don't have the answers, but here's what I know. I know a guy that does have the answers to your problem, and his name is Jesus. Every one of us know people who need Jesus. You know people who are having marriage problems. You know people who are having family problems. You know people who are having financial problems. You know people who are an emotional wreck, who maybe they've lost their job. Maybe they're spiritually far from God. You know people who have, you have no idea where they'll spend eternity. Listen, Jesus is the answer to all of their needs. You say, preacher, I don't know what to tell them to do. Man, don't get hung up in that. I don't either. One of the most freeing things is a preacher is is saying, I don't know. Sounds like a mess to me. I'd be tore up too, but here's what I know. Here's what I know. Jesus is the great physician. Let me get you to him, and he'll start to do the work in your life that there's no way I can do it. You are there to lend a hand and to take people to Jesus. Number one, we all know people who need Jesus. Number two, let me say this. You may have to rip the roof off. Now, getting a paralytic man to Jesus shouldn't have been a problem, right? Like, you would have thought people would have made way. You you, you thought people would have said, oh, wait, here's a quadriplegic man. Let's get him to Jesus. But the truth is, there were a lot of barriers Between the men, the stretcher, and Jesus. Number one, the crowd was not going to cooperate. They were not going to give him any help whatsoever. The paralytic man could not help at all. They were carrying a stretcher everywhere they went, so they couldn't really worm their way through the crowd. Jesus was locked up tight in a small house that was jam-packed inside and out with people. People standing in the door. Other people who had problems who needed healed, and they just were not going to make way. There could have been hundreds or may have even been thousands of people. The truth is, a normal effort was not going to get this man to Jesus. A normal effort. Look, here's what many of us would have done. We'd have been standing in the back of the line, and we'd have been saying, well, I hope this line moves faster. Hope Jesus is there when we get there. I hope Jesus has enough. I mean, they didn't know. I hope Jesus has enough spiritual juice saved up for when we get up there that he can heal this man too. I mean, they didn't know. A normal person would have just said, man, Let's stand back here and we'll, we'll scoot up an a, a inch or two every time he heals somebody and let's hope we get up there. Well, not these four men. These four men looked at each other and they said, well, hey, this line is long. What are we going to do? One of them said, well, I walked around the back of the house. There's not a back door, not a back window that I could find. And the windows, we could break them, but um, make a lot of noise and uh, uh, I don't think the stretcher would fit through. He said, but there was a ladder leaning against the back wall of the house. So, well, I got an idea. What's the idea? You, you boys aren't going to like it. Tell us what it is. How much money you got in your pocket? I don't know why. How much does the roof cost? I don't know. What's the idea? I say we take the ladder, we hoist him up on the roof, we go up there. I know about where Jesus is. I saw him through a window. Let, let's rip the roof off. Let's tear it off. Tear it to shreds, and let's, uh, let's lower him down through the roof. 
you know, he's probably a little nervous. They probably had a, a, a discussion about insurance coverage, you know, who's going to cover insurance. Then they finally got into a tool discussion. What kind of tools you have at home? I mean, I got a power saw at home, which we know they didn't, but just humor me for a second, right? You know, I got a power saw at home. I got one of those Black & Decker things that they do. And, and I, some guy said, I got an ax. That'll help. I got a sledgehammer. That'll work. Hey, boy, let's just lay him here. Let's go get all our stuff and come back. So they went and got all their stuff, and they came back. They got him up on the roof, and they said, so just so, so we're clear, this is the best idea we have, right? Like, this is the best, this is all we can come up with. One guy said, hey, once I heard rip the roof off, I've been in every since. You know, it's like, that's the funnest thing to do. We're going to get in trouble, but let's just see what happens. And so they began with saws and hammers and hands and whatever. Started ripping the roof off the house. Now, don't act like everybody was sitting in the house hearing the roof ripped off, not wondering what was going on up above. But saw, 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 hammer, 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 and all of a sudden, there's a giant hole in the roof. They didn't ask for permission. They didn't worry about what anyone thought, and they didn't care who liked it. They had somebody in their life that needed to get to Jesus. I can see him lowering him over the roof, lowering him down, lowering him down. Boys, he's hit bottom. What do we do? I don't know. Just look around inconspicuous like. Maybe he won't recognize us or something like, like that. And they said, no, I, I want to watch what's happening. Here's what they decided. If Listen, let me, let me put it in terms of us. If you're going to get the people in your life to Jesus who need Jesus, ordinary effort in all probability will not get the job done. People are farther from God than they've ever been in the history of the church. You're going to have to make it a priority. You're going to have to do whatever it takes. You're going to have to go above and beyond because it is a life and death and eternity situation. And I just want to say this, that when the stakes are that high, ordinary will not do. We had an interesting presidential election this past year. I don't care. I'm not talking politics. Thrilled that Jim's parents and uh, are up in Washington. That's the kind of good people we need there. So thrilled that that was an interesting election, to say the least. It was it was entertaining. Let me say it that way. It's an entertaining election. And um, when it was all over, I got to looking up um, how much money people the candidates spent to become president. Have you looked that up? Here, here it is. Donald Trump spent $975 million to become president. Hillary Clinton spent $1.4 billion to not become president. <laughs> Altogether, that's about $2.4 billion. So I didn't have anything to compare it to. So uh, 2012, Barack Obama spent $722 million to become president. Mitt Romney spent $450 million to become not the president. I refer you to Hillary Clinton's $1.4 billion. She spent more than Obama and Romney spent together to not become president of the United States. So I went back and checked. 1980, Reagan and Carter spent a total of $97 million. And then in the report went back to 1860. When Abraham Lincoln was elected president of the United States, he spent a total in today's dollars of $2.6 million to become president of the United States. Why do we spend so much to become the president or try to become the president of the United States? Because here's the truth. 
when you're the president of the United States, you are the leader of the free world. If you're running for student body president at high school, a couple of flyers will get you by, but not as president of the United States. The stakes are so high, the impact is so large, when it matters that much, an extraordinary effort is going to be required. Well, I want to tell you more important, listen, a hundred million years from now, when we're in eternity, we won't have cared who was president of the United States, but everybody around you will still be alive in some, some shape, form, or fashion, and they'll either be in heaven with you, or they'll be in a place called hell, away from God for all of eternity, and for one soul, the stakes are higher than being president of the United States. So if you're going to go through extraordinary effort, you may have to rip the roof off. That tells me you're going to have to have two things and just remember these. Number one, it's going to take muscle. And number two, it's going to take mindset. It's going to take muscle. You may have to work hard to get people to Jesus. You may have to spend money to get people to Jesus. You may have to put thought in getting people to Jesus. You may be inconvenienced to get people to Jesus. It may take sweat. It may take tears. But you're going to have to put some muscle. Again, people are farther from God than they ever have been. And you're going to have to put some work into getting people to Jesus. Number two, it's going to take a mindset. You're going to have to have the mindset of these four men. A mindset of pers persistence, perseverance, Whatever it takes, a no is not acceptable. The people in your world are there for you to get them to Jesus, and you may have to rip the roof off. Listen, it's the day and age of a church when a church has to do uh, go above and beyond. No longer can we just hang a flyer in the local store and hope people come because we've announced it. People, you say, well, people are anti-church. No, it's even worse. People are ambivalent to the church. We'd be far better off if they hated us. They just don't care about us. In the day and age, it takes a church that will go rip the roof off. It takes believers who will go to their places of mission and rip the roof off because ordinary effort will not get the job done. That leads me to the third thing, and that's this. Number one, you need to know we all know people who need Jesus. Number two, you need to know you may have to rip the roof off. Number three, you need to know your faith will be your fuel your faith will be your fuel i know that sounds like a lot of work i know what i'm saying it may even be hard it may be inconvenient but one word drives your efforts what is that word when that stretcher came lowering down through the roof and settled at jesus feet he wasn't staring at the paralytic man when that stretcher came down, now get the picture in your mind. I, here's, here's Jesus. Stretcher comes down. Jesus never looked at the stretcher. The Bible says Jesus was looking that way. And listen, I mean, be honest. I don't want to be one of the four guys who are looking back that way. Do you? I'm like, huh, this might not have been a good idea. It was him, Jesus. It was him. But Jesus, Jesus not even looking at the paralytic man. The Bible says when Jesus saw the faith of their friends, maybe without even looking down, he said, son, your sins are forgiven. Because it was their faith that drove this whole activity. Mark tells us that it was the faith of the four friends that in, in, impressed Jesus. They so believed in the power of Jesus that they would stop at nothing to get their friends at his feet. And so here's the question today. You can close your Bibles. I'm going to be through in just a couple minutes. Here's the question today. When it comes to your friends getting to Jesus, do you believe Jesus is the answer to the problems that surround the people that you encounter every day? If you do. If you really believe Jesus is the answer to every problem in life, that faith will be your fuel that will cause you to go to extra mile. Extra effort, do one more thing, invite one more time, work out whatever needs to be worked out. Why? Because you believe John 14, 6 is true. When Jesus said, I am the way, I am the truth, I am the life, no man comes to the Father but by me. If we believe Jesus is the only way, that faith will be the fuel 
that drives us to do whatever we have to do to get our friends to Jesus. Here's a statement. Boldness is the natural byproduct of knowing you're right. You only hold back if you're not sure. Boldness is the natural byproduct of knowing you're right. If you were here when I was the interim, uh, I know some of you were, some of you weren't, but you know I'm, I'm madly in love with this woman down here. Like, I live, eat, and breathe Sherry, like, we've been boyfriend and girlfriend since I was 16, she was 15. I was her bag boy at a grocery store called ShopRite. And her mom came into the store one day on a Friday night and uh, interviewed me. I didn't know that's what she was doing, but she was interviewing me. She got me over in the frozen food section, aisle number 11, and she said, Hey, you're a happy guy. Let me ask you some questions. Sure, lady. i never seen her before. She said, uh, make good grades in school? Yeah, all that. Good, good. Go to church? Yeah, yeah, my dad's a lay preacher in our church, and we go to church. And she just began to ask me questions, and I turned on the charm. I didn't know what was going on. You know, I'm just like, somebody's interested in something. I don't know. And she said, well, I, I got a daughter I want you to meet. And then I was like, oh, brother. You know, every mama thinks their daughter's good looking. It just ain't so, ladies. It just ain't so. And so I didn't know. <laughs> I'm 16. I'm not very deep. You know, I'm not very deep. And so she brought her daughter in the next week and good night. I saw her through the back room window and I have been in love ever since. Two weeks after I met her, I told her I was going to marry her one day. But I had not yet asked her to be my girlfriend. So I felt like that was, a, that was a step I needed to cross first. And so I, I just wasn't sure. She was not allowed to date. She was 15 years old. I, I turned 17 shortly after that, but she was 15 years old. And, and, and so uh, uh, I, we, we'd been kind of hanging out at the grocery store of all places. And I got religion, too, because her dad was a pastor. So I started showing up to her church for everything, you know, Sunday morning, Sunday night, Wednesday night, WMU, whatever. I was there do it so that was kind of the way we were dating and so but I didn't ask her to be my girlfriend I had my class ring and back in the day 1985 I guess uh this would have no no yeah 85 I guess we gave her my class ring and um I would so I was wanting to give her but I didn't know what she'd say I, we haven't been seeing each other for that long and so this is a a seldom told story of our relationship we were in the back room at ShopRite Grocery Store where they kept all their stuff, and there was a guy who worked back there named Bert. And Bert knew I was madly in love with Sherry. All the boys there kind of had a crush on Sherry, but Bert knew I was madly in love with Sherry, and I said, Bert, I want you to do me a favor. I said, Bert, I want you to call Sherry. Back, you know, it was all landlines back then. And I said, I want you to call Sherry, and I want you to ask her this question. If Joel were to ask you to be your his girlfriend, what do you think you would say? I, I think it was pretty smooth move on my part. <laughs> Doesn't feel like it so much today, but back then, man, it was like it was like strong move. And so Bert gets on the phone, I dial Sherry's number, and Bert's trying to make small talk with her, and it's not working well, and it's awkward, and she's wondering why Bert's on the phone, I'm sure. And, and Bert said, well, I just have a random question for you, just out of the blue, no reason. Um, if Joel were to ask you to be his girlfriend, if that were to happen, what do you think you might say? And she said to Bert, after a few trying to figure out what was going on. She said, well, I would probably say yes. So Bert said, she said she'd say yes. <laughs> that wasn't a plan, Bert. That wasn't a plan. Hang up the phone. <laughs> so Bert hung up the phone. I waited an appropriate amount of time. I mean, it was a good 45 seconds. And I said, uh, <laughs> I'll dial the phone. I said, hey. Hey, baby. Just happened to be at work today, just walked by the phone, saw nobody was on it, and 
Thought I'd call you. She was really, yeah, yeah, yeah. I said, Here, here's my question. Because I knew the answer, right? Like, I already knew the answer. So you, you got to work it if you know the answer. I'm like, you and I both know I'm the total package, right? We know I'm the big. <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm it. I'm it. We both know you'd be honest to wear my class ring. So what about it? You want me to push you to the front of the line, baby, and let you be my girlfriend? <laughs> now, I didn't quite say it like that. To be honest, I was a little smarter than that. But I did walk over the phone, and I picked it up boldly, and I said, hey, baby, would you be my girlfriend? No quiver in my voice, no shake in my voice, no trepidation whatsoever. Why? Because I'd already got the answer. The answer was yes. So here's the truth. I was bold because I knew what the answer was. And can I say to you that if you're going to be bold in getting people to Jesus, it'll be your faith that is the fuel to that boldness. Because if you believe what the Bible says, that Jesus is the only way, why wouldn't we do everything in our power to invite people to church, to tell them about uh, uh, Jesus? Listen, every Sunday is a great opportunity for people in your life who are far from God, people in your life who, who, who their lives are totally messed up, they're clueless about spiritual things. Listen, they may have tried a bad church and walked away. They may have used to go to church a long time ago. Here's my challenge to you today. Be bold. Rip the roof off. Look around and have faith. And go after them like you would want them to come after you if you were one heartbeat away from hell. So I don't know what it's going to take. For some of you, you need to make a phone call. For some of you, you need to make a visit. You need to send a text. You may need to take them to lunch on a Sunday afternoon. You may have to invite them over for dinner. You may have to go pick them up in your car. You say, preacher, we have to do all that to get people to Jesus. We have to do whatever it takes to get people to Jesus. And I know what some of you are thinking. You're thinking, well, that man had four people working on him. Well, be careful. You've got God who loves them on one corner. Jesus who died and rose again on another. The Holy Spirit who's drawing and convicting them. Here's what they're waiting on. They're waiting on you to pick up your corner of the stretcher and be bold and have faith and be determined that you'll rip the roof off if you have to, to get your friends to Jesus. You could be here today and you don't know Christ is your Savior. Hey, here, here, here's the truth. Everything we do, we do for you at church. This church, you, you saw the baptism videos. Their heart beats and bleeds to introduce you to the Lord Jesus Christ. You say, well, I thought, you know, there's some classes I have to take to be a Christian. It, no, 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 that's true. Jesus has done everything you've got to do. Everything needs to be done. He's done it for you to be a Christian. So here's the process. It's as simple, I like to say, as A, B, C. A, you've got to admit that you can't get yourself to heaven. Hey, that's true for you. That's true for me. I'm a professional Christian. I get paid to be good, but I'm not good enough to go to heaven. I wouldn't trust the best five minutes of my life to get me into heaven. So you've got to admit, hey, I can't work enough, I can't give enough, I can't turn over enough leaves, I can't come to church enough. Listen, you say, well, I'm, I'm going to start coming to church. That doesn't work. Coming to church all your life doesn't make you a Christian any more than standing in your garage makes you an automobile. So you've got to admit, I, I can't earn my way to heaven. You've got to believe, B, Christ died on the cross for our sins and rose again the third day. We don't negotiate those things. We just believe those things. It's in the Bible. History bears it out, and we trust it. And C, you've got to call out to him. Confess him as the Lord and Savior of your life. The Bible says, whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. So here's the